Everyone, it doesn't seem like the mic is on. No. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I think I think that will work. Thank you. Thank you. That's better, I think. All right. Good. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, members of the media. Uh, I'll make a, a reasonably short address and. Um, then Advocate Cronier will have a few words to say, and then we'll be ready to take questions and answers. So it's been almost four months since I briefed the media on the 1st of February, the first day that I took office. And I would really want to thank you for your patience. I had intended to brief you all sooner, but I didn't quite appreciate the depth and extent of the challenges, both internal and external, that I'd be facing in trying to revitalize the National Prosecuting Authority. I am the seventh NDPP, or acting NDPP, over the last decade. Over this period, the NPA has experienced, as has been publicly revealed, politically motivated changes in leadership, allegations of impropriety against some of its leadership, an exodus of skilled staff, a hiring freeze, a virtual end to its professional development and training programs, and a fiscally induced vacancy rate that has brought the NPA's operations close to collapse in some centers. I have in the per past five, four months been listening, understanding, engaging at various levels, and attending to various priorities that were identified. And these include and in no particular order of priority, addressing the NPA leadership crisis. This, as I said when I took office, is critical to restoring the credibility of the NPA. The NPA needs a fresh, new, dynamic leadership. I made important changes that were widely reported on, and I won't repeat, but more needs to be done. However, for various reasons, this has not been as quick or as easy as I would have liked it to be. But important progress will be made shortly. Secondly, the conduct of reviews of high-profile cases relating to decisions to prosecute or not to prosecute. This will also assist in restoring the credibility of the NPA. In this regard, we have identified a number of cases, including those investigated by IPID, which we are reviewing. A review of the structure of the NPA. To improve effectiveness, I have decided on a decentralized model, which is in line with the NPA Act, with a small, specialized, highly skilled capacity at the national office to actively support prosecutors in the regions. This will build more capacity in the regions, maintaining specialization, for example, with regard to the Specialized Commercial Crimes Court, terrorism, and other crime types that may be identified, for example, like cybercrime. Obtaining more budget for the NPA. This is a very, very serious problem for the NPA and for criminal justice. There has been no recruitment in the NPA since 2016. The impact on the delivery of justice and the morale of prosecutors working in extremely challenging conditions is huge. We will not be able to deliver the service that the people deserve and expect or effectively deal with holding persons accountable for crimes that is outside of the investigating directorate if the situation persists. This is one of the key issues to be discussed with the new Minister of Justice. Managing cases relating to state capture, including the creation of the investigating directorate, has been a key priority, which I will deal with later. The challenges we face have provided opportunities to begin the complex process of revitalizing and repairing the NPA. Together with the leadership of the NPA, I have also been working on a number of other important priorities and issues. Partnership engagement. And in this regard, I would like to recognize our national commissioner as well as the head of the Hawks we have been working very, very closely together, and we'll elaborate on that in a bit. To achieve our vision, the NPA must collaborate with its governmental partners, including 
particularly the police and the courts. I have made it one of my priorities to reach out to our partners and candidly discuss challenges, and there are many, which have impeded effective cooperation. I have met with the police commissioner and we've had an extremely uh, constructive and positive uh, discussion about how to move things forward. I have had several meetings with uh, Lieutenant General Sitoli, uh, the head of the Hawks. We all recognize that there are huge challenges in law enforcement, including in the prosecutions. For example, lack of skills, lack of discipline, corruption, etc. And these all have to be addressed. However, we have been working very closely to address various priority cases. We've also been working with the Financial Intelligence Center, the Special Investigation Unit, Investigating Unit, and the South African Revenue Service, amongst others. Stakeholder engagement. I have sought to reach out to the business sector and civil society groups, which represent important constituencies in South Africa. My outreach efforts include South Africa's development partners, including the foreign diplomatic community, who are watching very carefully whether we can reverse the effects of years of state capture in order to place South Africa back on a positive development and economic trajectory to restore the rule of law and build confidence in our institutions. Strengthening morale and empowering the NPA staff. On my first day in office, I requested that a staff survey be undertaken. New in my position as NDPP, I wanted to hear from everyone in the NPA. The NPA succeeds or fails on the ability, skills, and knowledge of our people, our greatest asset and resource. To succeed, we must nurture and empower all our people's skills. To this end, I'm undertaking numerous visits to our regional and local offices across the country to meet with, to listen to prosecutors and staff working at the coalface of the criminal justice system. I've asked for a review of the NPA's professional development and training capacity to ensure that we have the human resources and skills to be the cutting edge prosecution service that we can all be proud of, ready to meet the challenges it faces. Create a strategic support and innovation co capacity in the office of the NDPP. My office will draw in skills and resources, including private sector and international experts, to provide capacity to the NDPP's office to focus on longer term strategic issues, trends and challenges facing the NPA and criminal justice. It will also serve as an innovation hub to new and creative solutions to intractable operational and, and institutional challenges facing the NPA as well as the criminal justice system. So what is my vision? I, it isn't really my vision because listening to the prosecutors, I realize that we all share the same vision and that is to rebuild and lead a trusted and effective prosecution service that pursues justice for all South Africans through independent, professional, and victim-centered victim service delivery. This vision depends on four key pillars, credibility, independence, professionalism, and accountability. An important role for the N that the NPA has to fulfill is to undertake effective prosecutions. The country is crying out for this. But the NPA is about much more than only prosecuting cases in court, long after crimes have been committed. The work of the NPA must and will make an effective contribution to the country's socio-economic development. In addition to all the other crime types that the NPA has to focus on, including sexual and gender-based crimes, corruption, as we all know, has become endemic in our society. There is, understandably, tremendous hunger and impatience for justice and the expectations for immediate arrests are high. The proclamation of the investigation directorate is an important step to restoring the rule of law in South Africa. The SAPS and the NPA are working closely to ensure that we are able to address the scourge of corruption in our society and in our country at different levels. 
the provincial commissioner has committed his full support and the support of SAPS to the work of the investigating directorate. And as I said, you can see that both General Libya and the national commissioner are here. I am pleased to introduce you today to Advocate Hermian Cronier. While many of you will have seen from other media reports that her academic and professional qualifications and past work experience more than qualify her for the position of investigating director, I want to ensure you that having worked with her in the past when we were both in the NPA in the early 2000s and then again over the past two months, I have absolute confidence that she has the temperament, the resolve, and the commitment to make a success of this hugely challenging assignment. She is passionate, astute, and will fiercely defend the rule of law. If anyone can do this job, I know she can. <laughs> As you know, Advocate Cronier has been working closely with Advocate Johnson, who is also present here, over the past months in getting to grips with what progress is being made within the NPA to hold accountable those implicated in corruption. They will continue to work through which of the cases would be referred to the investigating directorate and which cases will remain with the prosecutors, particularly in the specialized com commercial, criminal cri commercial crime unit. It is therefore also vital that outside of the investigating directorate, other cases of serious corruption which the NPA will have to deal with, together with the SAPs, which are destroying our communities and have eroded public trust in state officials, also receive the necessary attention and resources. The establishment of the directorate will immensely strengthen the capacity to address corruption. <coughs> However, I want to caution that complex cases take a while to investigate properly. And as you know, Many cases have been neglected for many years, and we cannot fail with the cases that we bring to court. But I am confident that those responsible will be held accountable. We will relentlessly pursue the course of justice and respect for the rule of law, and it will respect for the rule of law will prevail. And so thank you, ladies and gentlemen. At this point, it gives me pleasure to hand over to Advocate Cronier, who will give you some more detail about the investigating director and directorate and how it will work. Thank you. Do you want to maybe? Uh, yeah. Morning, everyone. Oh, I have to move there. Oh, you may. <laughs> okay. I'm already unseated. I can <laughs> see that. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Is that better? Yeah. Thanks. Um, I was warned not to put my glasses on my head, and that's the first thing I did. So you see, I'm not good with following instructions. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very grateful to the NDPP for the confidence that she has expressed in my ability to do this job. I'm also encouraged by the support and commitment received from the generals um, right next to us. I'm also profoundly humbled as well as energized by the positive response with which the announcement of my appointment has been received. Also a little curious and surprised. Um, but I can assure you that the decision to accept this norm enormous challenge is not one that I took lightly by any means. I am aware of the enormity of the task. And you, you've heard from the NDPP um, the extent of that challenge. And just to, to, um, to agree that I'm aware that our, our institutions are in a poor state, particularly the institutions represented at this table. I'm also aware of the problem in our state-owned enterprises and the need to send a strong message that those who pocket for their own personal gain 
funds earmarked for the development of our country and for meeting the needs of our people will face the consequences of their actions. And of course, I'm aware of the need to restore confidence in the institutions of government, particularly at the highest level. I'm also aware, and, and the NDPP has, exp has explained, the constraints that we face. We will need to rebuild the skill and capacity, and you've heard the NDPP's plans in that regard. I'm also fully aware of the expectations of ordinary South Africans. Very high, almost impossible expectations. And I also have no illusions that those responsible for the state of affairs we find ourselves in are not going to be sitting by idly waiting for us to get our act together. So I'm aware of all these challenges. But I also know that South Africans are resilient and the prosecution and the police are no exceptions. We have allies in this fight, in the NGO sector, you in the media who have done a lot of the investigation work one would have expected uh, from this side of the table in the past in faith-based organizations, trade unions, and ordinary South Africans who want to win back control of their country. We fully intend to harness their support. We also have support from our counterparts around the world, from investigators and prosecutors who face similar challenges in other countries. So I'm securing the knowledge that certainly I'm not alone. We are not alone. So that's me. Now, uh, what you came here to hear about. What have we been doing to get this directorate up and running? So I just wanted to reiterate the mandate and the scope of the work of the directorate. It sets out in the proclamation published by the President and the Government Gazette. We are required to focus on serious, complex, and high-profile corruption particularly those emanating from the commissions of inquiry into state capture, uh, the PIC, as well as uh, the commission of inquiry into SARS. So we've envisaged at the outset to focus operations on the following three broad areas, themes, work streams. Um, the first is corruption in the security sector specifically the criminal justice system. We want to ensure that we restore the integrity of government. We need to, and in order to do that, we need to get our own house in order first. The public needs to have confidence that those who need to address this problem are able and, and, and capable and have the integrity to do so. The next big focus area will be uh, our state-owned enterprises, no surprises there, ESCOM, Transnet, Prasit, Prasa, sorry, and a few others. And then a third area would be high-level public and private sector corruption. Yes, that, that is the other uh, category. But the idea is to focus um, on those who have systematically and actively sought to corrupt government procurement systems and processes for private gain. So, our operations, it's envisaged that we will only take on a very small number of cases. So our case selection criteria will ensure that we address those who planned, orchestrated, and instigated the corruption of the system and those who ultimately derived the benefit of the looting of state coffers. Not, not only those foot soldiers who were merely implementing their corrupt schemes. So we want to address those who actively and systematically weakened the capacity of the criminal justice system to ensure that the 
corrupt escaped accountability for their crimes. So we're aware that there's a general frustration with the failure on the part of the criminal justice system as a whole to deal with serious corruption. What that means for the directorate is that there will be intense pressure to take on every, corrupt, uh, every case of corruption um, that has been out there. We want to emphasize that the investigating directorate is not a replacement for the existing structures. We are not taking over the mandates of the people at this table and other institutions in the criminal justice system. Our role is to address high level corruption. And the particular crisis that we face at this point in our country. Our approach will be a coordinated one because what we don't take on will have to be adequately addressed by other parts of the system. So our case selection criteria will be mindful of and aligned to that of the other role players in the system, particularly the DPCI, the Hawks. We've been consulting with DPPs, Directors of Public Prosecution, and the Hawks on the boundaries of our respective mandates to ensure that we avoid duplication, or even worse, we avoid cases falling through the cracks. And we're also aware that there's no need for competition. Unfortunately, there's more than enough work to go around. So mindful of the need to take swift action in the short term, we're aware that, that people are waiting and many are reserving judgment until they see action. Um, as the NDPP indicated, I've already been working with my colleague, Andrea Johnson, to determine the status of cases already being dealt with in the NPA. She has identified many of the challenges that need to be addressed in order to make swift progress on these cases. And so for cases that fall within the mandate and that meet our case intake criteria, the immediate focus will be on coordinating, overseeing, and strengthening our capability and our capacity to ensure successful investigation, prosecution, and the recovery of assets. So personnel working on these cases will remain part of these teams, provided they agree to subject themselves to the enhanced integrity screening and vetting and have the skill and capacity to perform at the required level, they will come in to work with the directorate. So we are in the process of establishing a core operational team, a very small team to lead the, the directorate alongside me. And in that regard, I'm very pleased to be able to say that we have procured the services of advocate Jeff Budlander SC, a senior counsel at the Cape Bar, to provide strategic legal advice on a range of topics relating to preparing these cases for court. We have also secured the return to the NPA of advocate Tandem Gwengwe, the former operational head of the Scorpions, who was seconded to Swaziland, where he headed up the anti-corruption agency in that country. In addition, we have been working closely with uh, the police particularly the DPCI, who have made available staff to work with us in the establishment phase. Similarly, colleagues from the Financial Intelligence Center, the Special Investigating Unit, the South African Revenue Services, and the State Security Agency have all pledged their support in ensuring that the direct makes a success of its endeavors. We've also had several engagements, as the NDPP alluded, to the private sector, and particularly with bodies like Business Against Crime, SABRIC, the accounting and the legal profession, to look at innovative and cost-effective ways to access skill and capacity in the private sector rapidly. The responses we have been, we've received have been overwhelmingly positive. We also intend to engage civil society, not only to provide input on specific investigations they have found in the past, but also to look for ways in which civil society can continue to hold the directorate to fulfilling its mandate. 
just on a word on recruitment more generally. Um, the NPA Act does not envisage that we appoint staff on a permanent basis into the directorate, but rather it envisages that we select a matter for an investigation and then identify the skill and capacity needed to address that particular problem. And so it envisages that we source skill and capacity from wherever it exists, be it within the public sector or in the private sector. And so once brought into the directorate, personnel will dedicate themselves full time to the directorate for the duration of the assignment. So reassignment from elsewhere in the public service, and in some cases secondment, will be the basis on which staff will be recruited from within the public sector. We also aim to recruit from the private sector, legal, investigative, forensic, um, computer skills, on a contract basis. The principle is, however, that whoever is recruited or assigned to work in the directorate will be subjected to security vetting and to initial and ongoing enhanced integrity testing. Lifestyle audits will be the order of the day. Personnel will therefore need to agree to subject themselves to these enhanced measures. As I indicated in the beginning, I'm alive to the challenges we face, but I'm confident that we have in this country what it takes to make it work. I'm enthusiastic, I'm keen, and I'm committed, and I'm thrilled to be back in the public sector fighting the good fight. But I'm also equally clear that there is no magic wand, despite what you read about in the papers, although, yeah. I mean to bring one to them. Um, and we are no superheroes. We don't have our costumes in the back there. But what we do have is all of you, every South African who wants to turn things around. And so with that, I know we can do this. Thank you. I'm talking with you. Am I talking with you? You're coming here. Now. Yeah. Can we Would you like to? to no, we don't want to. We don't want to. Are you okay? With or are you okay? All right. <laughs> kind of musical chairs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the change of chairs. Sorry. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, maybe as the South African, on behalf of the South African Police Service, <coughs> I would like to pledge uh, our support to the NPA. But it's not only support per se. I think SAPS has got a turnaround vision. And in terms of the turnaround vision, there's provision in the, turn, in the turnaround vision for an integrated strategy between the South African Police Service and the NPA. So this initiative that is coming into play today is actually part and parcel of the integrated uh, strategy. And uh, it's part and parcel of a long journey, which we refer to as in terms of our theme on a journey to a safer South Africa. There's few things that are, are critical that we will be dealing with together with the, the NPA in terms of the integrated strategy. One of them is coming up with a resource matrix between the NPA and subs. I think as we are improving, working on the ratios, balancing the ratio of the police to the public, the same will apply to the NPA because if we update the ratio without looking at the NPA, it's going to clock the NPA. <coughs> now, as a result, part and parcel of what we're looking at in the integrated resource strategy 
it's it's looking at a resource matrix between ourselves so that we complement uh, each other but the most important it's a it's a complementary and an integrated performance management system subs cannot perform better than npa and npa cannot perform better than subs we can only perform better outside there in the public so it's just confirmation that this is part and parcel of a strategic and a shared vision for the wind direction of the country. I thank you. Thank you very much. I think you may want to come closer. Come closer. <laughs> um, okay, so you know how to do it. Um, please um, raise your hand when, I, uh, when you're about to speak. You will identify yourself in the media house you represent and tell us to whom you're, you're directing your question. Thank you. I'll take, I'll take the three at a time. Eh? Please, please, please. So, Tanita, Mendy, and, and, and yourself, want to speak. Should I go? One, two, three. Yeah, Mike. Yeah. Is there a mic? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Tony, thank you for the Sunday Times newspaper. Um, I have a series of questions. We'll start with the uh, NDPP advocate. Um, where are you going to get money from? <laughs> Your, your plan is heavily dependent on, on resources, where are you going to get this money from? <coughs> Secondly, um, are you in concert in talks or are you considering uh, uh, replacing your, one of your deputies, Nong Tobu Jiba and uh, Special Directors uh, Lawrence Maybe what, what are the talks or the considerations around that particular issue? Um, at the Kenya, uh, Will you or can you announce the first cases that you've isolated? Can you tell us? And also, are you going to announce it on an ad hoc basis, which cases that you, you particularly are going to investigate? Um, and then what determines who is sort of the masterminds uh, in, in, in the cases that you're going to um, uh, sort of consider? And how are you going to guard against the same accusation that was leveled against the Scorpions in that you were, um, uh, that, that, that there is some sort of vendetta or political motive that sort of dictates um, uh, why some cases are, are pursued over others. Uh, moving on to the other members of the panel, um, to the Hawks here, General Libya, um, I understand that this may not be the time, but I just really want to know what is the, situ what is the case um, or the situation with a member of your team, Major General Zinclair Inunopi, uh, who was pro referred to as the, the first sort of victim of state capture, and particularly what General um, Advocate Premier says about um, you know the, the the integrity of the criminal justice system being weakened. So, what is the what is the status of Major General Zinclair Inunopi, and is she in your office? Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mandy Wiener from News24, and uh, welcome and congratulations. Um, firstly, just regarding your strategy around competency, um, which you, you rightly acknowledge is, is going to be a huge issue for you. Um, your, your idea of going uh, out and, and looking to the private sector uh, and to other organizations is obviously going to be very extensive. Um, are you expecting the, the country's private sector and corporates to perhaps uh, support you in this endeavor? Are you hoping that they will support people to you for free, essentially? Uh, or what is your strategy around that? And is there a call on the private sector to, to help you out here, to rebuild? Um, and then I, I understand that obviously for political reasons the, the generals are sitting next to you. But would you have preferred, um, and do you think it would have helped the public confidence if you had a Scorpions-type unit within the EPA, 
rather than investigating directions, which obviously uh, sees you relying on, on the Hawks and, and the police investigators. Would you have preferred that, that Troika type approach? And then just lastly, um, what is your relationship like with the investigators at the State Capture Inquiry? Um, and what is happening around the Bosasa case there? Um, are you concerned that if you prosecute uh, now in relation to the State Capture Inquiry, that it could put off people going to the inquiry to testify um, while that inquiry is ongoing? Thank you. Okay. Well, my two colleagues have taken two of my questions, so that's going to be easy. Um, my name is Peter Dutel, also from News 24. But, uh, but uh, my first question to you. Um, you've spoken about restoring integrity in institutions, the integrity of the National Prosecuting Authority. Can you give us some detail into what you found when you arrived here? Um, in the media and in the public at large, we've been, we've been seeing um, this challenge, the challenges that the MPA have had over the last decade or so. Um, it's been difficult to get proper insight into what the status of the NPA and the state of the NPA was. Can you give us some insight? And then uh, a short one, and uh, adding on to my colleague's advocate, Kronia, how close are we uh, to seeing the first state capture-related case go to court? Uh, as you rightly said, there is um, an insatiable thirst for uh, justice. So can you give us some time frames? Thank you. how we're going to do this with moving around uh, the microphone. Let's start with those. But the first one, um, where's the money going to come from? Um, uh, and Kronje has a little more detail about the budget, but as far as the investigating director is concerned, um, we have assurances and we, uh, we know that Treasury will make the money available to us. Um, so you can maybe say a little bit more about that, but as far as the director is concerned, I have no doubt that it will be properly funded, it will receive the money that it needs to do its work. Uh, as far as the rest of the NPA is concerned, that is more of a battle. Um, and I, you know, I, it's really important for me to stress what Advocate Cronier said, that the directorate will only deal with a small number of cases. But the number of corruption cases out there is massive. I mean, we have seen almost endemic levels of corruption. So we really need to capacitate the rest of the NPA, as well as the Hawks, because a large proportion of that will be dealt with in the other in, in the SCCU and in the and with the Hawks. And so if the NPA doesn't receive the resources for us to be able to address the massive amount of corruption out there, we're going to be failing our country. And so it's hugely important. Part of part of my um, you know key or my first tasks when the new minister is appointed is to really look at how we could access more money for the NPA more generally so that we can address uh, the scourge of corruption as well as you know other crimes I you know it's corruption is not the only crime facing our country but I know it's hugely important for the country to to move forward that we actually deal with corruption effectively but there's a whole range of other crimes that the NPA needs to deal with effectively and so if we really want to give justice to victims across you know all victims that are um, you know victims of crime that we need to better resource the NPA and that is that is a huge problem for the NPA at this point so hopefully we'll be able to that they are hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel in that regard um, and then the question about the uh, previous Deputy National Director of Public Prosecutions and Advocate Jeepa and Advocate Murebi. Um, as you know, the matter is currently before par Parliament. And so once we, I'm aware of what the final outcome of that is, I will be able to make decisions with regard to possible replacements. Thank you. The first cases, maybe. Um, so just on the budget, um, we, we obviously are in an environment of scarce resources, um, but, and, and so it does compel us to be creative about how we go about um, funding the directorate. So we've put together a budget. I mean, th the challenge is we have no idea, we have some idea of the extent of, of what we will be doing. We just don't know exactly how that will pan out. So what we've done is we've, um, modeled ourselves on the commission, uh, the Zondra Commission, the State Capture Commission, um, chaired by the Deputy Chief Justice Zondo, um, to sort of baseline our, our budget 
uh, for the next three years. There's six months left of this uh, budget cycle and we've been assured that in the adjustment uh, estimates the, the directorate will be catered for. But it's, it's also a question of uh, the ability to spend that money um, speedily that, that we need to look at. So the Act very much uh, envisages secondments and, and short-term contracts being the order of the day and it's how we go about procuring that skill. We have also put together a bid from the criminal assets recovery account, the account in which we put uh, the proceeds of, of crime recovered by the asset forfeiture unit. And there's a healthy balance in that account and we have um, applied for a fair chunk of that money um, and, and feel very confident that we have a very strong proposal um, to be allocated that money. The bulk of that money is for uh, non-recurring expenditure, so we can spend it on, on skills, forensic skills, private sector forensic and legal skills, which is what we intend to do. Um, first cases. The first cases. Um, so I don't think we'll be announcing in advance who we will be swooping on um, uh, initially. But what I can tell you is, as I've said, we've sat with Advocate Johnson and we've looked through um, the cases already in the system. And many of them um, are well advanced. Um, what we need to do is ensure that we understand the full picture. That before we proceed, um, although we won't initially proceed against what um, has been referred to as the masterminds, we want to know that we have a reasonable understanding of um, who that is um, and how we will um, address uh, those people. Um, so what the role we're going to play in relation to those cases that we have already identified as cases that are closest to um, court readiness is to put them through a process um, of sort of peer review to ensure that they um, are as ready as we've been led to believe. Um, who determines who's the masterminds? Who determines who the masterminds are? The evidence will mm -hmm. determine who the masterminds are. But what often happens in cases is um, we are either too overwhelmed by the vastness um, of the scheme um, and, and, and where ultimately the tentacles reach, that we are paralyzed to act um, against those that there is a relatively strong case against. So our sense is that we want to act um, um, against those w where the case is already fairly solid, but um, we want to at the same time develop our capacity and understanding as I said. So it's a, it's a balancing act that we will um, be figuring out as we go along, but our commitment ultimately is that unless we're having an impact at the very top, we're not really going to be solving the problem. So that's why we will spend far more energy and focus on that. And that's something the criminal justice system struggles with around the world. There's a struggle to work on the cases that take long, that are hard. And so that's why um, I don't think you will expect to hear from us every other week, but when we do act, you ought to have the confidence that we are getting um, at the root of the problem. Private sector funding. Mm. Private sector funding. Um, so it's related Please, to yes. just thinking about the budget. We have been inundated with uh, Tuma Mina um, offers of assistance. Um, and, and on an individual level, but also institutions like the bar, like the uh, SABRIC, the Banking Council, have come and, and have put on the table ways, creative ways in which they think we can um, address the problem. So that, that is why I am particularly encouraged that we are not alone. There have been so many offers of assistance that um, the challenge is, you know, trying to use all of them as, as efficiently mm. as, and as quickly 
as everyone is um, excited to give it. Scorpions so, so uh, what your question was, is this a call to the private sector? Um, it is, but we, we have also resolved to make the call more formally. So there will be a communication in the, in the next few weeks about exactly the logistics around how we will procure private sector skill. But obviously, the cheaper the better, but we won't compromise on quality. <laughs> and obviously, there's also the vetting requirements, because we, we anticipate that offers will come from all quarters, um, not just those with a genuine intention to assist. And whether you prefer the scorpion type as a pause. So that was for you. <laughs> <laughs> We're just we're just passing that bucket. <laughs> no, I th no, I think look, there's one or two things. So, sorry, it's just on um, guarding against. There was a question about you know when uh, against you know like the scorpions were attacked uh, you know and political motives etc. That's going to happen. It's definitely going to happen. We are going to be accused of of pursuing persons for political and other motives and we expect that you know we will personally be attacked as well for various reasons and we hope that when that does happen that civil society and those that want to fight the good fight will be behind us to ensure that we actually do hold people accountable irrespective because this has got nothing to do with any agendas it's all about the evidence and it's all about solving the massive corruption problem that we have in South Africa as far as the um, would we have prepared, preferred a scorpion type? To be honest, the, the powers that this directorate is going to have is very much, very similar to what the scorpions had. So as far as the powers that are concerned that the director would have, it's very similar. But I think we actually need to work closely with our partners in the police. And we certainly don't want to be in a position where we have those turf wars that existed between SAPs and the police. So I think in as much as we have to deal with getting the right people, and we need to ensure that the vetting and other processes that we put in place to ensure that we have people that are not corrupt that come into the space, um, I'm actually really looking forward to dealing with our partners in law enforcement. Because remember, this is not a permanent solution. This is, as what the commissioner has called, it's a, it's a project. It's a temporary project for us to deal with a crisis that the country is facing. And so moving forward, SAPS and the NPA need to take lessons from this and to ensure that we can mainstream you know, the good lessons that we take from this project to ensure corruption is not going to end and all the other crimes, hopefully we will be able to have better impact. But law enforcement and NPA need to be able to deal with this effectively. So I'm very pleased with the, with the current uh, structure as far as this is concerned. Um, and then I'm just checking if there are any other questions for me before I hand over. <laughs> what did I find um, at the NPA when I arrived? Why do you ask such difficult questions? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've heard a lot about it. This, the, the Commission of Inquiry have actually helped me uh, in that regard. Um, but all I can say is that I found huge challenges. Uh, I, I can safely say I think it was worse than I expected. But also, very committed and dedicated staff. And I want to say that to start off with, there is an absolute groundswell of good, dedicated prosecutors just wanting to do their jobs better and working under very difficult conditions. And the, and the problems with credibility in the NPA were largely one of leadership at, at different levels. And that is, um, you know, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to reflect on, on some of the things that, that have, have really, as a prosecutor, I, I've thought, you know, I, I, I couldn't imagine that, that things could have happened in the NPA when we are, we are the defenders of the Constitution, we need to uphold the values in the Constitution. And that is why we do what we do, is to ensure that justice wins. And so when, when I, I've been talking to a number of people, and, and when, I, when I look at certain cases, and I look at what some of the staff have been telling me here about what went on here, they were persecution of certain prosecutors as well. And so you know, those that wanted to fight the good fight had a really hard time. And so, you know, I, I, I think it was, 
it was hugely disappointing that as defenders of the prosecution, uh, of def defenders of the constitution, that, that the NPA could have, you know, I look at some of the decisions and I think, how could we have taken these decisions? And we're reviewing many of those. And so I think it was a very disappointing uh, experience for me because, you know, I, f I feel in many ways we failed the people of South Africa and law enforcement generally did. Um, but as I said when I started off, there's a lot of very, very good people in the NPA. And I'm sure that, that share the vision of a new NPA. And so notwithstanding the challenges that we face internally, and we haven't by any, man, by any means addressed all of them, I'm confident that, that together we can move forward in the NPA. And we can really restore the credibility of the NPA. It won't be easy because as we know, as you know, it takes a long time to build credibility and trust. But it's very quick to ruin that. So it's going to take a while, but I know that we are, we are on the right track uh, with, with the good people in the NPA. Thank you. I think Commissioner was the... Uh, um, I'm not sure we're going to... Maybe if we pass <laughs> this, would that work? Yes, or you st if, I'm not sure if that will work. <laughs> yeah, I think... Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. The question that has been directed to me is uh, regarding one of my uh, good presentations. General, general, if um, if we of prosecute, could they put As to whether she is still in the office, the state of there. Uh, you shall have uh, observed initially when the issues were raised in the state commission that uh, we went back to the South African Police Service discipline regulations. We instituted an investigation and uh, to ensure that uh, we also give an opportunity, we uh, suspended. As the regulation requires that uh, this uh, suspension need to be for a specific period, uh, that is what uh, we have provided. <coughs> In terms of uh, the uh, discipline regulations, after completion of uh, the departmental investigation, we decided to charge her departmentally. The process of uh, uh, discipline one dis departmentally, although it's not the same as uh, in criminal court, is more or less in the same direction. Uh, advocates were appointed to preside over. The others were representing the uh, employer who took uh, the matter forward. So the hearing took place. Those who uh, made allegation in the uh, state uh, commission testified before uh, this uh, disciplinary panel. The employer closed its case and then uh, it was for the employee to present the case. Unfortunately, the uh, employee is unwell is, uh, at this uh, moment. Uh, in the hospital, we wish a speedy recovery. So the process is going on. So that is uh, the current status. She is in the office. She has been assigned other responsibilities other than to do the uh, anti-corruption investigation. In that space, we have appointed another Major General to be active until such time that uh, the matter is disposed for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, last one on the, the last one on our relationship with the State, Cap the State Capture Commission and Bosasa, quickly. Um, we've been working quite closely with the State Capture Commission. Um, the volume of information at the Commission has been mind-boggling. And so we've been working with them on a capacity to analyze and interrogate the data that they have. We've also um, agreed to work more closely on, on witnesses that are testifying to make sure that if there are witnesses that we intend to use in criminal cases, um, that we share that information and, and plan and strategize accordingly. So we are working very closely. Um, the NDPP has uh, appointed two people in the NPA more broadly, but we have also, in addition, um, been engaging with the NPA. And I just wanted to say on, on Mandy's question about the scorpions, 
um, because you mentioned specifically the Troika uh, principle. What the directorate does have that is, um, was unique to the Scorpions um, and isn't really replicated elsewhere in the system is that we have under one roof analysis, investigation, and prosecution skill and capacity under single line of command almost. So, uh, and as far as I'm concerned, that was the, the great strength of the Scorpions. Um, but on, on the question on Bosasa, um, Bosasa and, and probably even Estina, these are cases that have already been before court. And so they are higher up on the priority list to ensure that we address whatever the outstanding issues were and that we uh, move speedily on those cases. But that's all that I think we want to say at this stage about specific cases, that we have a, a, a strategy to prioritize, we have a short-term strategy and a long-term strategy, and um, you'll have to judge us by actions. actions. Yeah. Um, before we move on to the next round, I just wish to announce that the National Commissioner is here away and we are preparing all the day. You know, okay. There is the inauguration of the President tomorrow and he's very central in the management of logistics and everything. So he is going to need to be excused. And so maybe if you, if there are two questions, this is already answered one, two questions are directed <laughs> to the National Commissioner so that then we can, um, can be excused. I mean, we're really grateful that he actually mm -hmm took time away from, from where you were supposed to be because it's where um, you were supposed to be the whole day. So two, just for the National Commissioner, two questions, and then we will let the National Commissioner go. It's also good if they are none, because then the yeah. National Commissioner can be <coughs> Uh, good day, Barry Bateman. I would excuse my, my question is not to the Commissioner per se, but it is relevant to the Commissioner. Um, Advocate, you were talking about working closely with the counterparts in the criminal justice sector, taking on cases that are already established, working with IPID. Um, and then you talked about you're not going to get into the situation of a turf war between infighting and so on. But I'm already identifying a conflict of interest on the panel sitting here in that the general himself is the subject of the investigation by IPID. Um, in a very serious uh, matter involving tender fraud um, of the procurement related to, I think it was a crime intelligence matter. So already you're sitting with somebody at a high level within the organization. How do you anticipate dealing with this particular difficulty, considering you're sitting with a suspect of an IP investigation <laughs> at this stage? <laughs> I think I'll take that first. I think all I can say to everyone from the president downwards, if we get evidence, you'll be prosecuted. But in the meantime, we need to do a job together. And, and just to add, the state of affairs in the criminal justice system is, is as I go around anything? looking for people to work with, every time I mention a name, eyebrows get raised and I get warned that, oh, you have to be careful about that person. So it's, it's virtually impossible to, to go on the gossip, rumor, and speculation that is out there. What, what the national director has, uh, the assurance she has given is that if there's evidence, we will deal with you. We will address you. Um, and we have the space, uh, the independence um, to do our job. So, so unfortunately uh, for the commissioner, if the evidence points to his culpability, he will, he will be dealt with. But um, I can't say that um, I'm at that point by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. Um, Thank you. And, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
thanks Kudema for looking to this site in the end. <laughs> um, my name is Molo Komloto from DNCA. I, I just want to know the names of the Gupta brothers has been mentioned several times in that commission. We are aware they are out of the country. Does it mean they are scot free? They will never be touched because they are not in the country. The second question relates to the statement that was made by the leader of the EFF, Mr. Julius Malema, during the launch of his uh, party manifesto. He was clear that he has no confidence in you, Advocate Vatohi. He believes that uh, you are here essentially uh, as a henchman. And now I want to ask specifically, given the fact that uh, a case against him several years back um, was struck off the roll, whether that case is among the cases you are considering, you are reviewing and considering to reinstitute. Good morning, I'm Mr. Buller from Open News. Firstly, advocate, I'd like to say um, congratulations on the appointment. Um, just for your purposes, um, I know some of these cases are dealing with quite complex and highly profile cases implicating political leaders, especially looking at revelations emanating from the state capture inquiry and other inquiries as well. Do we have, we have like a time frame of how long some of these cases can move to action? I mean, we know a lot of South Africans are actually hungry to see prosecutions actually taking place as some of these cases have been dragging for quite some time. And number two, I just wanted to know how are we going to deal with political interference? Because we know some of these parties have large constituencies whereby if they utter something, they would, their, their, their backup or supporters would rather go against the prosecuting authority and, and believe in the party. How are you willing to work with that? Thank you. Yeah, it's um, Claudia Manovich from Business Day. I just wanted to find out, um, Toy, um, specifically when you spoke about the review of high profile cases that the MPA is currently conducting, does that review include, as we most probably, prominently would have seen in the inquiry of Advocate Jiba Mukhwebi, um, looking into the prosecution of Richard Lully, as well as Johan Bresen, which was two of the cases which was most prominently dealt with? And then just in terms of Advocate Jiba, um, I know during the inquiry <coughs> they did speak in terms of there was a little bit, there was not a lot of clarity in terms of whether she would be charged for perjury or not. There was some informal um, message being sent from her advocate at that stage, from her legal team at that stage, that she wouldn't be prosecuted for perjury and that, that was the decision taken. But we, as of yet, we don't know anything formally what the decision is. Um, and just a softer question for Advocate Cronier. Um, you said it was a very long, like it was a difficult decision to make. It wasn't taken lightly. But was there anything specifically that made you go, okay, this is the moment I will definitely do it? Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is, sorry, my name is Pilar Mahali. I'm from Newsroom Africa. This is the first one from me. Um, um, I'm okay, but uh, is a part of your uh, you, 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 uh, reviewing, reviewed what, uh, you know, those which are in process cases, which are in process, it seemed as if the NPA was not initially ready on the first time. Um, are you perhaps looking into ensuring that it's back on the wall? And um, and uh, remember that the Concord had ruled that the uh, former uh, social development minister, Tabele Kamili, uh, uh, said that she, she, she should be prosecuted for pressure. Uh, is that something that you uh, perhaps as well looking into? And uh, 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 last one for me is um, uh, from Abusasa CEO Angela Grisi said uh, um, something stuff about uh, uh, Mr. Watson. He said he had deep uh, tacticals within the NPA. Um, is that something that is worrying you in, in, your, in, in your work? You said there's something that you are not happy with perhaps when the state of the NPA of which you have found it in. Um, are you trying to, are you, will you be looking into ensuring that everybody's work is working and uh, of course uh, there's no kind of a stooge for someone else? Okay, yes, everybody. Um, so I'm 
The book just maybe you want to deal with that one first. The question is, are they, are they gone? Or are they you want to deal with that yes, first? I'm happy. Yeah. Um, the, the question was, um, uh, the Guptas are out of the country, does that mean they escape um, liability? Um, so, I, I, don't, uh, if you, I spent the last five or six years um, working for the Stolen Assets Recovery Initiative, um, which is a joint initiative between, between the World Bank and the UNODC. <coughs> and I worked in countries like uh, Tanzania, Nigeria, Sri Lanka, Ukraine, and the main job is to recover the proceeds of crime. So that's certainly a big area um, of work that that's I'm very excited um, to be doing. Um, and also, this is not in relation to the Gupta specifically. Anyone who tries to evade justice by just fleeing our borders, um, well, the international community has made <laughs> unbelievable steps in, in working together to ensure that there is accountability. So I'm, uh, you know, in Dubai, for example, uh, the UAE, we now have a bilateral agreement to support and facilitate those kinds of things. So as I've said in the past that numerous fora, and it relates to the last question of what made me come back, is we have amongst the most progressive, most advanced legislation in this country, in the world. We just need to be using the legislation. So we just need to step up to the plate. So we certainly plan to use all the tools at our disposal to address those that need to be addressed. Frida Dairy Farm, he asked. Um, and the Frida Dairy Farm, I think I already alluded to, that is a case that um, has already made it onto the court roll. And in our prioritization, we have looked at cases that are already in court um, to, to re address what were the problems um, and, and try to resolve them. So certainly um, that one is on the list. Time frame for cases. The time on. frame for cases, that, that is quite a tricky um, one because you look at uh, cases like Frieda Dairy and it was a case where prosecutors um, decided this case is ready, let's go. Um, and even now in the review, the more you look at it um, and, and the more you talk to the commission and its sources, the more things uh, expand. So it's about how to tackle the elephant. Um, and we're, we're deciding um, to take uh, bite-sized chunks. Um, but I think uh, I, I would uh, prosecutors will all be having their jaws dropped if I committed to a time frame <laughs> within <laughs> which we will be ready. But I assure you that um, we are not uh, unaware of the expectations and are not um, ignoring uh, the need to act swiftly. And I'll just add to that. You know, they say when you go after the king, you've got to make sure you kill him. And uh, basically, it means you've got to have a watertight case. You know, yeah. we will be attacked, not just the evidence, but from various, various avenues, from various, um, you know, and quarters. And, you know, at the end of the day, we have to make sure that we don't rush with cases, that we do bear in mind the expectations of the country, but also that we have solid cases. And so that is really, really important. But at the same time, we are aware we need to demonstrate that the wheels of justice are turning. And so we will be looking, you know, at various other cases, but you know, people have to understand that, you know, these cases, we cannot go to court and have another Estina Dairy uh, debacle where cases are withdrawn because, you know, we haven't properly investigated it. So it's really important. So to understand that these, some of these key cases that people are waiting for accountability might take a bit longer than people would like to, but at least we must get it right. Um, the other questions on... Uh, politicians having expressed no confidence in me. Uh, as I've said, you know, opinions will abound and people will, will say good things today and bad things today, uh, tomorrow, or you know, vice versa. And my view is that I don't really care about what people say because there'll be opinions. I say to Bulalwa, I don't want to know what's going on in Twitter. I know what I have to do 
That's the focus, not I. I mean, that sounds a bit too arrogant. We know what we need to do as the NPA, and I know what as a leader I need to do. So that's our goal. There will be whisperings and there will be all kinds of allegations, but we have to ignore that and ensure that we are pursuing justice. And so, you know, and hopefully when, when the allegations become too bad that we will have people out there that will be supporting the NPA because they know we are fighting the right, the good fight. Um, cases being reviewed. Um, we have, uh, yes, we are certainly looking at those cases involving the politicians that have been mentioned. Um, we are we're reviewing the cases of all the names that have been mentioned. Um, Business Day, yes, to your questions as well. Um, the perjury matter, um, are we waiting for the outcome of the, of the parliamentary process and then a decision will be made in that case. Um, and... How are we going to, oh, yeah, the tentacles are deep in the NPA. Well, you know, we, I'm aware of allegations, and so we certainly looking, and the Zondo Commission, the Commission of Inquiry into State Capture, has not yet completed its work. So what I can say is that, you know, we will look to all of these allegations, and where people are guilty of impropriety, we will deal with them. I have said to prosecutors, as I'm traveling throughout the country as well, there's no place for corruption in the NPA. But I know that th there is corruption. There are corrupt prosecutors, and they are very good prosecutors. And I've said to them that we will be absolutely ruthless in dealing with prosecutors that are corrupt. There's no place for prosecutors. We are defenders of the Constitution, and you can't have corrupt prosecutors that are prosecuting people for corruption. So yes, there have been allegations. And uh, there are processes in place, and I'm looking into all of them. Um, what convinced me to take the job is I left very reluctantly. Um, like me. <laughs> and, and, but, but outside, I, I was living a very comfortable life. Um, and thought, who needs this kind of stress and, and, and trouble? I think what persuaded me is I, I sat uh, the NDPP down and said, OK, I need to wrap up now the kind of the support I've been given you in the last few months. And I realized I won't be involved anymore. I won't be able to be in there and make this happen. And I thought, I'm in. So. <laughs> So if anything, it was the fear that I won't get to do what I now get to do. Um, thank you very much. Um, last round. We have to wait for more cases. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be the last round, and it's Mandy. Um, yes, to get more cases identified. And and we're closing it. Um, So I'm making this drum about competency. Um, so, uh, General Olivia, if I can ask you, um, the past both of you really, but there has been a, a bleeding of resources to the private sector. Uh, my understanding is there, there are no longer forensic accountants that are, are working at the Hawks. Um, I, I'm trying to get my head around the strategy of going to the private sector or relying on, on kind of short-term contracts. What is the long-term strategy to rebuild these institutions specifically? <coughs> How are we going to get young people back in? How are we going to get experienced people? Um, all of those investigators that have gone to, to audit firms or to law firms, what is the strategy around that? And, and how are we going to build competency long term? Um, and if you could maybe just elaborate more on, on the day to day functioning of this investigative di directorate. How is it actually going to work in terms of going to, to consultants and and working around that. If you can maybe just talk more nuts and bolts about how it's actually going to work. Good morning, advocates. Good morning, General. Kia ora, Victoria from the NCA. Um, um, just um, on a general point, in, um, you, you spoke about failing the citizens of, of South Africa. Now, transparency is obviously an extremely important part of, of that. Um, like the police do every year, they do have crime stats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and there's there's sort of been a, a lack from the NPA, just in terms of, of communicating some successes and/or problems that you have. Is there by any chance a, 
uh, I assume you won't have that information offhand. For instance, the amount of corruption cases currently on the roll um, and successes in prosecuting. Would that, would that be some type of thing, serious and violent crimes, etc.? Is that something that you would actually look into to communicate more with, to South Africans to ensure the transparency and, 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 and more faith? Thank you. Very hard to say, um, the Guru Productions. I, I just want to follow up on that question in terms of transparency. The NPA is set up in a way where you do work behind closed doors. Can you just, I think it would be important to outline the, how the integrity, the enhanced integrity test relates to, um, to that nature of your, your operation in a way. Uh, the, that's the general question. The more specific question, it would be the bilateral agreement with Dubai. I mean, the attractiveness of uh, that jurisdiction for investment is its secrecy, is its opaqueness. What can do you believe you can actually achieve through that bilateral agreement? What information will you be able to get your hands on? Okay. Okay, we'll start first, and then general will follow. Um, <coughs> so maybe you want to, yeah, uh, skills, skills, capacity. Well, it's a topic I get uh, very excited about. It, you know, reinvigorating professionalism in the prosecution and um, upping our games in terms of skills. I, um, in the private sector, I worked with forensic accountants that just would blow my mind away. And so one of the things I've been thinking about is how in the public sector we can have access to that skill in an efficient um, and cost-effective way. You'll know that uh, when we started in asset forfeiture um, with uh, Willy Hofmeyer, one of the first things we did was consider recruiting a forensic accountant um, to have on staff full time to help us follow the money. The, the person earned, I think, more than the national director at the time, had about three years of work experience. Um, and after a couple of months, we realized it was not really being productively utilized. And it did not give us the kind of expertise that you would get from someone located in an institution where they're doing this work on a daily basis. So that was not necessarily, you know, getting those people permanently on staff is not necessarily the solution. The other thing that we must recognize is that in South Africa, the private forensic um, investigation space was booming. Um, there was no shortage of work. People got mandates to do investigations, sometimes the same investigation over and over and over again without anything um, happening. So one of the things we did early on is call together the accounting profession because it, of course, is doing its own soul searching um, and, and looking at how it got itself into trouble. And we are trying to fashion a model that can work. It looks like we will need to, if we want to recruit at a very senior level, look at retired um, experienced practitioners and have them in a role where they advise on mandates, because that's also been a big issue that people get given a mandate and the scope creeps and before you know it, I mean, in, in some cases that wasn't normal, it was corruption mm -hmm. with, you know, contracts balloons to uh, 10, 20, 100 times the initial um, agreed price. <coughs> so we are also looking at models around the world and seeing how this kind of skill is available, made available uh, around the country. One thing I'm sure about is that, you know, people don't do work for law enforcement for the money, trust me. Um, they do it because they're passionate and they, they're driven by what, what you can do in the space. And so I already see people wanting to return, even though working in the private sector is much more lucrative. So the more we make this a space where you can actually do the work that investigators and prosecutors need to do, the more, and, and we just need to be creative about finding. So I don't have 
we're going to recruit so many. Um, we are looking at a mechanism for uh, having those skills available. And what we said is that we're not going to have people in this directorate, um, what's, what's the word, on a, a permanent basis, you know, the uh, security of tenure. Um, because what we want to do is identify the task and then assess the skills that we need for that task. So we won't have people sitting around twiddling their thumbs waiting for work to come. They will work on an assignment and once they've done that they will go back into a, their home departments and, and carry on there. And the private sector recognizes that those are valuable skills and, and that mm -hmm. this is an amazing training ground for those skills. What we need to ensure is that we retain expertise within uh, we manage the vetting, we manage the, the integrity issues, and, and we manage to keep our secrets and not let them be available to our opponents the very next day. So there's some complexity, but we, we are working, in it, and I know the Hawks have been grappling with this very problem for, for a while themselves, so I don't know if I should hand over to the general to add to that. And then come back to you. Yeah, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, the question of uh, bleeding resources in the DPCI uh, and what is the long-term strategy. Indeed, uh, we have uh, analyzed the situation in the DPCI. Uh, you will recall that uh, in some spaces we have indicated that uh, we lost a number of people who were trained in this environment and uh, no less than 100 uh, were lost since 2015 and uh, some of them we have already recruited them back into the DPCR. Uh, also there is another element of uh, secondment which is how we capacitate on a temporary basis. We have as we speak seconded 38 uh, members from the greater SAPS to assist in the capacity. But uh, we have also conducted a work study to say that uh, is the structure that uh, we have in the DPCI designed to match the crime situation in the country. And that work study I think that uh, is almost finalized. Uh, we are just now consulting the last minister in terms of the act because the act prescribed who are the ministers that uh, need to be consulted when you deal with this uh, we believe that uh, by next month we shall have finalized knowing precisely how many we need among those that uh, we have is again the post of uh, uh, forensic accountants in the past those posts were advertised and as my colleague is saying we couldn't attract uh, the people at that level of uh, brigadier is very high in our space but to attract chartered accountants and the like forensic uh, accountants mm -hmm. is not but uh, we we are still going to uh, do that one and uh, again it has been indicated that uh, we normally make use of uh, those in the field uh, of uh, forensic accounting because uh, it's a mat matter of giving them a mandate that uh, in this specific one we need a, a, a chartered accountant. It's not all the cases that uh, you need chartered accountant. So that is how we are dealing with uh, the strategy of uh, long-term capacitating ourselves with regard to various areas, including uh, the chartered accountant space. Thank you. Thank you. See, the sad reality about corruption, it's not just about the money that has left the country. It's about the money it's costing us to hold people to account. And, and, and these investigations are incredibly expensive. So uh, that's just another uh, ripple effect of, of corruption. Um, on the transparency issue, um, um, yes, you know, we, we need to look at, you're right, now that I come to think of it, I don't think the NPA has been uh, releasing any statistics uh, um, publicly. Uh, what I can say to you is that the number of really serious, complex corruption cases that were dealt with last year, 
I could probably count on my one hand. Um, there have been there have been cases that have been dealt with, uh, you know, and very very. I, I don't even think there have been any person that's gone to prison for for corruption. I think there was one case recently where there was a prison sentence. I'm talking about your high level complex corruption mm -hmm. cases. So clearly. You know, we need to relook at an overarching NPA strategy. The the the, the uh, directorate is one one part of dealing with corruption, but there's massive amount of corruption. And so we will internally. I agree with you. Part of the vision of the new NPA, if you look at you know, w in fact, we are having a strategy planning next ne session next week uh, with the senior managers of the NPA, which is I think happening for the first time in maybe more than five years. But it's about us re reinvent invigorating ourselves and moving together as one PA. And one of the pillars of the new vision is transparency. And we really need to, to unpack that, look at what, what does it actually mean to be a transparent NPA. And so we do need to give you know, certain decisions for um, reasons for certain decisions and all kinds of things. But yes, and, and that will build confidence and trust. Um, but as I've said, and as Hermian just mentioned, you know, we could sit here and say all kinds of things. At the end of the day, we would be judged on what we do by the actions of the NPA. And, uh, but certainly that transparency is one of the key pillars. And we will look at how, how, what a transparent NPA looks like and what, what we need to do to ensure that we could actually give effect to that. Um, yeah, I wasn't quite, we weren't quite sure about the question relating to the transparent, the integrity issue relating to transparency. So if you could uh, please uh, clarify that would be useful. And then there's the issue of the Dubai, you maybe just want to touch on that. Yes. Your decisions aren't open to public scrutiny. So what is the link between that and the enhanced integrity test? And I'm really trying to get you to articulate the importance of uh, the integrity of the because you are not open to public scrutiny. I mean, uh, I think the reason why we're struggling is because many of our decisions are uh, subject to intense public scrutiny. Whenever we decide to prosecute, or you will see in the courts on a daily basis um, whether we made the right decision or not, so there's intense scrutiny there. When we decline to prosecute, there's uh, often review, uh, uh, review processes and we have to answer for those decisions. So there's certainly accountability. Um, so, um, and, and definitely we do have very strict rules around um, confidentiality, if that's um, the issue you, you, you're getting at. You know, there are strict rules around confidentiality and what, can, what mm. private information mm. can be communicated um, and usually is that they should not be communicated. Um, but that is not um, the reason or that is not why we are not transparent and accountable. We, we can balance accountability and transparency um, mm. with the need to protect confidential information. Dubai. So, uh, Dubai. Um, that's why uh, the STAR initiative exists, because safe havens like uh, Dubai and the others who used to be called safe havens are a lot less safe because of the activism um, around opening up the, uh, and, and greater transparency in those safe havens. But uh, the UAE remains one of the hardest uh, nuts to crack. Um, there are many ways, though, to skin a cat. And what one of the things we've already done is just to understand from our side what steps did we, in fact, take to secure uh, the extradition of, of people in UAE and what um, requests have been sent and what follow-up has there been. So just a proper understanding of what is actually going on, what efforts did we in fact make. Um, and coupled with that, um, uh, I think it's public knowledge that the UAE will be hosting the UN Conference of State Parties um, uh, uh, conference okay. in December this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, which puts it in a very awkward position 
um, around uh, challenges uh, to its transparency and assistance um, to countries dealing with corruption. So we think um, it's a good time for seeking and procuring the assistance of the UAE, um, and we intend to do that properly armed um, with uh, good information. So, um, but that said, even countries like the US and the UK who have great leverage, they struggle. Uh, and we have had to become adept at uh, finding ways around the problem. And one of the ways around the problem is, is, is other jurisdictions who have leverage um, who are who will support um, our efforts to hold accountable those in our country? I think that's probably all I should say for the moment. <laughs> okay, um, I think that does it for today's media briefing. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time and attention. Also, just to assure you that this is not the first and the last <coughs> media engagements that we will have with you, particularly the investigating directorate. I know you're looking for. Um, real action that's going to be out there. So um, those who have requested one-on-ones, um, um, and we'll consider those, we'll sort of win, you know, to make it fair. We'll both definitely engage. So if, if you're not able to do it today, we'll do it next week or the other week. So please bear with us. We really want to talk to you as well. So um, thank you for coming this morning. I know it's a, um, quite a thing to try and get you to Pretoria, especially those from Joker to come all the way. Thank you very much. We appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.